So I'm Andreas Kotsaram. I will present the paper Jobs and Internet Partner Violence, Evidence from a Field Experiment in Ethiopia. And the paper is written with me and Espen Villanger. So internet partner violence entails large costs in terms of women's health, productivity, shame, and fear. It is a problem that is prevalent in all countries of the world, but to varying degrees. The costs are really large. So Ferron and Hoffler estimate that the cost of the world GDP is around 5%. Uh, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's even larger. So it's estimated that, uh, that the cost amounts to around 15% of the region's GDP. Uh, internet partner violence is a large problem in Ethiopia, which is the context where we do our study. There are many theories about the relationship between employment and internet partner violence. The most simple theory simply states that if women uh, become employed, they will automatically become empowered and uh, when they become empowered, the internet partner violence will, will be reduced. But of course, there are other theories and more nuanced theories stating, for instance, that if women become employed, their partners may not like it. And they may use violence to counteract the increased uh, empowerment by their, by their partners in order to reinstate their power within the family. It is also the case that if uh, internet partner violence is used instrumentally in order to extract resources, it may very well increase when women get a job because there are simply more, more resources to extract. So uh, in general, one can say that uh, how, one, uh, how one views this phenomena theoretically depends on whether violence is seen as expressive or instrumental and whether the effects are moderated by other behavior and attitudes at the micro and macro level. So most previous evidence on the relationship between employment and, and intimate partner violence is based on correlational studies and they find both types of correlation. In particular, one finds uh, that um, uh, employment is correlated with intimate partner violence with more intimate partner violence in, in countries that are more acceptance of violence, whereas in, in countries where violence is less accepted, then the relationship seems to be negative, that is the correlation. So such correlations are of course very illustrative, but they do not tell us whether employment affects intimate partner violence, whether intimate partner violence affects employment, or whether, which is very likely, there is some other factor that affects both employment and intimate partner violence. So there are, of course, studies that have used uh, better identification strategies than just correlational analyses. And uh, in particular, there are a series of papers using Bartik instruments. And the findings from those studies is that when labor markets have better conditions for women, abuse decreases in the US and in the UK, but it increases in Mexico and in areas of Spain, in Spain where men are traditionally breadwinners. So our project is the first to identify the effects of jobs on intimate partner violence using a randomized field experiment. So what do we do? We cooperate with large firms in Ethiopia to randomly assign applicant women with partners to either a job offer or not. We collect baseline data before randomization and follow up data at three points in time. So the experiment was pre-registered and uh, everything I'm going to show you today is, is pre-registered. We have some exploratory analysis in the, in the paper as well. So what do we find? Well, first of all, we find that baseline employment is positively correlated with abuse. That is, if we just take the women at baseline and we look at whether they have had the formal job ever before, we find that those that have had a formal job before are more likely to have been abused in the last three months. And this is exactly what we would find if we were to download demographic and health survey data for Ethiopia or for Sub-Saharan Africa in general. So this, uh, this correlation uh, is, is nothing special for, for our data set, but this correlation is uh, what we find in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a clear first stage predicting employment, earnings, income and time use. So for instance, we find that, uh, that uh, the probability of having a job or having uh, been working during the last six months is, uh, is 40 percentage points higher if women are randomly assigned to being offered a job. The earnings are also more than double. So it has clear material consequences. But we can reject relatively small average effects on intimate partner violence in any direction. So it's not only that it's not statistically significant, but the coefficient is, is quite close to zero and, uh, and uh, there's, there's no average, average, large average. Okay. So the field experiment was that we, we cooperated with uh, 27 large factories, mainly shoes um, and garment factories in Ethiopia, to randomly assign, assign around 1,500 African women with partners, either a job offer or not. 
And we collect baseline data before randomization, and then we collect follow-up data uh, after six months, after a year, and after one and a half years. And these are the regions in, in Ethiopia where we do where we do our study. So how does this work? Well, the companies first assess all job applicants and determine whether each applicant is eligible for the job or not. And then uh, lists are created containing eligible partner entry level applicants at a given factory and time. And then within these lists, we then randomly assign uh, people to either getting a job offer, which we call treatment, or to a control group. And this is possible since there's a large excess demand for jobs. So when these factories hire, they, have, they usually have set up a sign uh, on, the, on the front door of the factory areas, and uh, there are many, many people coming. So there are many more women who want these jobs than can actually get. The data is collected using a detailed survey instrument. So we have a survey team that whenever one of these firms wanted to hire, our survey team went there uh, to these factories and they interviewed women. And then they went there again after six months, after a year, and after one and a half. And the women are interviewed before they start working, and the first follow-up data collection is six months after the first interview. So uh, we find the reassurance that treatment and control women are balanced on a set of baseline covariates that are themselves predictive of abuse. And out of uh, our 1,500 randomly assigned women, we have interviewed around 1,300 for the six months follow-up, around 1,200 for the one-year follow-up, and around 1,100 for the 18 months follow-up. So there is definitely some attrition, but importantly, attrition is not correlated with treatment. Uh, the only thing that is correlated with attrition is, is age, whereby younger women are a bit more difficult to, to, uh, to find again. So we measure abuse using, uh, using standard survey techniques and standard survey questions. It's self-reported abuse, mostly, that we use. And uh, we base the questions on the sequencing uh, that, uh, that the Violence Against Women instrument is using. And we use the conflict tactics scale. So in particular, we use specifically trained staff that have a strict protocol to ensure privacy. So if anyone is within hearing distance, they do not ask the questions about intimate partner violence, and they instead ask them later on. And in particular, one uses different questions ranging from pushing, shaking, and slapping to attacking with a gun, knife, or other weapon. And this is uh, in order to give the woman uh, uh, multiple chances to, to reveal, um, to reveal uh, abuse. And also so that there will not be any, any definitional questions about what abuse is. This is, uh, this is uh, strictly defined as have your partner ever slapped you? And then if they answer yes, the question is, have, has this happened within the last three months or not? Okay. So we create our main dependent variable from these questions, and that's just abuse last three months, which equals one if the respondent has been abused by their partner in the last three months. And we find that 19.3% uh, of the women in our sample have been abused uh, the last three months. Okay. So our baseline specification is simply then regressing whether you have been abused during the last three months at the first follow-up. We regress that on a treatment dummy that is equal to one if you were randomly assigned to a job or not. And then we include list fixed effects because remember that uh, randomization occurred within this list, so these are important strata variables. Then we can control the outcome, uh, control for the outcome from a baseline and other controls if we want to, and we always show results both with and without. And a vector of baseline control variables includes uh, things like religion, education, age, and uh, uh, whether people have been working before. Okay. So the first stage is then we find that there are effects on the, of the randomization, employment and income. As I already shown you, the, there are large effects on the probability of having had a job uh, and on earnings. And interestingly, we also find that there are effects on uh, the share of uh, the share of earnings within the couple. So whereas women on average uh, in the control group earn around 22% of the the couple's earnings. This increases by almost 20 percentage points if uh, women were randomly assigned to have a job. The probability that she earns more than him is also almost doubled. So that's, uh, that's important, especially if we believe that the theory is about, uh, about the status inconsistency, then there may be a discontinuity at the point where she actually starts earning more than him. So that's uh, important that we, have some, that we have some first stage there as well. And uh, then uh, income from any source, not only from, from factory work, 
it's, uh, it's uh, definitely increasing quite substantially if, uh, if the women are uh, random assigned to, to uh, job boxes. Okay. We also see effects on time use. So we see that, uh, not surprisingly, the number of hours worked, uh, again, in, in any type of job, however the respondent wants to define it, is, is increasing, mainly at the expense of leisure and a little bit at the expense of doing household work. But note that household work is not decreasing as much as hours work are increasing. So there may be a double shift going on here whereby women's total amount of work is, is increasing if you add uh, household work and, and, uh, and factory work. So interestingly, we don't find that men are increasing their household work when women start working. What we do find instead is that the eldest daughter is uh, usually picking up some of the slack. Uh, they, the, the, the eldest daughter is usually doing a bit more household work. We also find that women reduce their social and religious activities and they attend less political meetings and, and so on. Okay. Then the effects on uh, intimate partner violence, as I showed before, there is uh, it's, it's negative, but it's quite close to zero. Uh, if, we, if we include all the baseline control variables, it's very stable. If we instead, uh, if we instead include optimal control variables by this uh, double debiot lasso approach, it's, it's very stable as well. And if we conduct the equivalence test, so we can reject that the effects are, are, relatively, are relatively large. So we can, we can say that uh, uh, or relatively small, I would say. So we can we can say that uh, we can reject relatively small effects, uh, both positive and, and negative. We do find some effects in the in the first follow up on emotional violence, and if we uh, if we look at the different components of emotional violence, we find that uh, that it seems to affect all aspects of emotional violence to, to some degree. So if we people are women are less likely to have been humil humiliated, threatened, or insulted by their partner. If they were randomly assigned to the job. So why don't we find any effects of employment on, uh, on our main measure, intimate partner violence? Well, there could be many reasons for this. It could be that employment does not affect important uh, mediators, such as empowerment or uh, gender attitudes. It could also be that it affects different types of women in opposite directions, and that uh, the effects then have to cancel out. It may be that female employment at the individual level is not important on its own, but it's the relative position within the couples that matter, with status inconsistency theories in particular. It may just be that it takes longer times. So the results I have shown you so far is just a six month follow up, or our measure may be biased by reporting issues. And we try to, to deal with all of these uh, aspects in the paper and uh, to, the best, uh, to the best of our ability. And uh, I will now show you some results from that. So what I think is, is really driving the results is that we do not find any effects on, the, on several important mediators, we should say, not moderators. So we don't find any effects on, uh, on, on women's attitudes with gender equality. We don't find that women become more empowered if they, if they get a job. We don't find that uh, acceptance of, of abuse is affected in any, any large way. And we don't find an effect on controlling behavior. So if I would have to bet my money on why there isn't any effect on, um, on partner violence, it would be because uh, these jobs uh, do not seem to affect women so that they so that they become more empowered. So we look a lot at heterogeneity, and in particular, we interact the treatment with all the baseline characteristics, and uh, we do not find any heterogeneous effect based on any of the baseline control variables. So if we interact with whether women have been working before or not, whether uh, whether the, their attitudes, whether they have been uh, beaten before, whether uh, their age, uh, education, religion, so on, we, we don't find anything at all. But there seems to be some heterogeneous effect with respect to empowerment at baseline, whereby treatment causes abuse to increase for women that were less empowered at baseline. But of course, we are testing many things, and some things should turn out significant. This is very plausible, but, uh, but it should be interpreted with care. So when we look at relative resources then, we find that status inconsistencies do not seem to trigger abuse at all in our setting. And in particular, job offers are not correlated with abuse for women with partners that are not working. Okay? So it's not the case that uh, if she becomes the main breadwinner, that then uh, violence starts to increase. We, we see no indication of that. And in general, relative incomes within the household do not seem to matter uh, much for abuse at all. 
once we use the random assignment of jobs to control for selection of this. If you just take the, the control group and look at the relative incomes for the control group, uh, one would uh, think that the relative incomes matter a lot, but it seems to be mostly driven by, by selection. So it's not the relative income itself, it's uh, basically something, something that drives both the relative income and, and the selection. So if we look at the longer term effects, uh, we more or less find the same thing. So if we look at the effects after a year, one and a half years, so there are still, we have a first stage on unemployment and earnings. So we're quite worried about that, but it still seems to be uh, substantial effects on, on the material resources of being randomly assigned to a job, but there are still no effects on abuse. And the effects on emotional violence are not stable. So we find them again after one and a half years, but there's no, uh, no effect after one year. So it's difficult to know how to interpret that. There are no longer any long run heterogeneity with respect to empowerment. So we no longer find that uh, interesting finding after one year and one and a half years of those that were initially at baseline uh, differentially empowered had different effects of being rather assigned. And then, of course, our reporting issues. So, whenever you measure self reported abuse, it's a function of two things, right? So, it's a function of whether you have been abused and whether you want to report the abuse. And we were very worried that uh, that getting employed or, or being randomly assigned to a job may affect both of those things, right? And they are very difficult to separately identify. So it's, uh, it could affect whether you want to report abuse or not. And there are many different theories for that. It could be that people want to report it more because they have uh, networks and talk about uh, such issues more. So it could be that uh, that, uh, that um, people uh, people want to report more violence if they are randomly assigned to a job. But it could also be that it's less. We, we don't know. So we don't think that there is uh, at least any kind of experimental demand effects going on because neither the enumerators nor the respondents had any reason to believe that the main interest was in investigating intimate partner violence. And we framed the survey as one to study the lives of women seeking work in the industrial sector in Ethiopia. And the survey is also long. It takes between one and one and a half hours to complete the interviews and only a small subset of the questions are about intimate partner violence. But most importantly, we conduct list experiments. And th while these may show some signs of underreporting, it doesn't seem to be that large. So they're not statistically significantly higher reporting if we use the lists, for instance. Uh, but more importantly, we don't find that underreporting is related to whether you're randomly assigned to a job or not, and not whether it's not related to whether women are working or not. Okay. So to conclude, does employment affect intimate partner violence? Well, if you look at theory and previous empirics, they point in different directions. Um, and we are the first to use randomization of jobs to assess the causal effects on violence. And our results suggest that we can reject relatively small effects on our main outcome, but there may be important short run heterogeneity. And of course, as the margin we study the effects on is one where everyone is applying for a job, it could be the case that it's the decision to apply that causes violence, not the actual work itself. It could also be the case that the contextual level employment is more important than the individual level employment. And indeed, if you go back to the theories about domestic violence, in particular the bargaining theory, they of course argue that, um, that the outside option is, 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 what is, driving, is what is driving the reduction in, in intimate partner violence. So it shouldn't matter whether you work yourself or if you can work, whether you, whether you uh, use your exit option and, and build a family. Uh, but in any case, even if those, uh, those things are true, our results speak against all theories that focus on the individual level or the couple level resources. We think that that's uh, interesting. And they are, of course, very context dependent. Whether you would find this if you were to randomly assign jobs in the US or Norway is uh, it's totally an open question. So thank you. And uh, on my homepage, you can find the paper, the preplan, and, and also the data. And uh, there's much more in the paper, of course. Thank you for listening.